Someone is in bed all day long and makes the whole house gloomy. It's really annoying because she can't even take care of herself, my mother-in-law, Vanessa, declared. I wonder how long she's going to stay here, sleeping all the time, my sister-in-law added. Every time they see my face, my mother-in-law and sister-in-law complain. It's the same whether Cameron has a wife who doesn't do anything or not. What's the point of him having a wife if she doesn't do anything? My father-in-law also joins in. I am Naomi Carter, 32 years old. My husband Cameron and I have been married for five years. My father died because of an illness when I was in high school, and my mother died soon after I got married. I have loved drawing since I was a child, and my dream was to become a picture book artist. After graduating from high school, I went to design school and got a job at a small design office as an illustrator. My husband worked for an advertising company, and we met when he came to our office, asking me to illustrate a character for an ad. After two years of dating, we got married. My sister-in-law also lived with my in-laws, but we decided to stay with them after we got married. When we got married, I became a freelancer, and they allowed me to work from home. I wanted to be a good wife and did my best at housework. It was easy to do because my mother-in-law didn't seem to like housework very much and told me that I could do whatever I wanted. My sister-in-law was also indifferent to housework and went out for drinks and dinners with her colleagues and friends every day. So we rarely had meals together, but we lived together without any problem. However, three years ago, I fell down a flight of stairs at a train station and was seriously injured. My life changed drastically. I suffered a spinal injury that left me with a severe disability, paralysis of the lower half of my body. It was quite a shock at first, but three years have passed and I am gradually getting used to this kind of life. My in-laws cared for me when I was injured, but they didn't expect that I would be unable to stand on my own legs for the rest of my life. And as three years passed, many things changed. In the midst of all this, my sister-in-law got married two years ago and left home. Now I won't have to see Freya anymore. I clearly sense that my in-laws are annoyed with me, who is now almost bedridden. I cannot refute my parents-in-law, as I can understand that it would be a burden to have a bedridden person in the house. Since my in-law's house is old, there's no space for a wheelchair to pass through, and I, who cannot move without a wheelchair, have to stay in bed. However, I have been working from home before the accident, so I am able to continue doing so. I consider it a blessing that my upper body is not paralyzed, and I am able to work. I am now taken care of by a helper and a housekeeper who takes care of me on a daily basis. If I had lived alone, the helper would be able to help me with the cleaning and laundry. But this is impossible since I have family living with me. A helper can only provide physical assistance. My husband can't take care of me because of his work. His parents are very healthy. My mother-in-law is not disabled or ill. My father-in-law turned 65 last year and is retired, so he's home all the time. Home helpers aren't supposed to provide assistance if you have family living with you who is healthy and not working. For the first two years or so, my in-laws helped a little while they were at it with their own chores, but gradually, they stopped doing it. I can understand that for my mother-in-law, who originally disliked housework, it must have been a hassle for her to do my stuff. My husband was also kind to me in the beginning, but now he rarely even speaks to me and does absolutely nothing to help. I have a job to do and caring for someone isn't a man's job, he says whenever I ask him for help. Just because my in-laws don't do anything for me doesn't mean that the helpers can assist me because of regulations. But the helpers saw my situation and with concern for me, introduced me to a housekeeper. What a waste of money to have a housekeeper. What kind of extravagance are you talking about? My mother-in-law scoffed. But I also have my personal needs. If you don't do my laundry, I won't have any clothes to change into, I retorted. Are you trying to exploit me, your mother-in-law? She asked indignantly one day. I don't think so, but with my situation, I have no choice but to ask you, I responded. When I said that, my in-laws looked at me as if they were looking at a nuisance. You're really a pest. You don't have that kind of money. I'll take care of it, my father-in-law said grudgingly. I was so glad I had kept my job. So I managed to get a housekeeper to come to the house. The housekeeper was a 52-year-old woman named Kate. Her husband died a long time ago, and she has no children. I felt she was somewhat like my late mother. 
She was a very kind and gentle person who took care of me very well, and I was very happy. Now, the only people I can talk to are Kate and the helper, not my family. When Kate arrived, my parents-in-law immediately tried to take advantage of the situation. Hey, you, do the laundry and cleaning over here, too, my mother-in-law demanded. No, Kate replied firmly. What? You're a housekeeper. What are you doing here? My mother-in-law insisted. If I do your part, it will cost extra. Will you pay for it? Then I'll do it, Kate responded calmly. What the hell is wrong with you? What an arrogant housekeeper you are, my mother-in-law yelled. There was an argument, but I felt a little relief when she clearly said no. One day, after about a year of living like that, my sister-in-law came back divorced. She said it was because her husband cheated on her. He was an idiot, so he must have been seduced by a woman. He was a nagging pain, she complained. My brother-in-law worked for a large company and seemed to be a faithful businessman. He didn't seem like the type of man who would cheat on his wife. I thought it was strange, but I didn't want to make trouble, so I didn't say anything. Freya, like her mother-in-law, wanted Kate's duties to extend to all the in-laws, but she refused. Kate didn't think well of them since she never heard them say a kind word to me. I decline, Kate said when Freya asked for her help. What? What are you doing here? Freya questioned angrily. To take care of Naomi, Kate replied bluntly. Huh? What do you mean? My sister-in-law was perplexed. She's a useless housekeeper just like Naomi, my mother-in-law added dismissively. It must be because she's not paying Kate enough, she continued. It doesn't really matter. Naomi is only earning as a side job. She's a useless woman who can't even take care of herself. That's why I have no choice but to ask the housekeeper for help, Freya added. Freya, Vanessa, you both can take care of yourselves so you don't need help, do you? Kate responded with a hint of sarcasm. My parents-in-law's sarcasm doubled when Freya came home. A bedridden wife is nothing but a hindrance. Freya has come back and you only make our house cramped. We need only Freya. You're well off, aren't you? You live on your bed drawing silly doodles, my mother-in-law said harshly. Even when I was working, my sister-in-law would go out of her way to come to my room to sarcastically criticize me. I was fed up with the constant sarcasm so I talked to my husband about it. Hey, can you tell your mother and Freya to be a little more careful with their words? I asked, added, I'm hurt too. Cameron shrugged. Careful with their words, but it's the truth, he replied. What do you mean the truth? I asked, confused. You can't even do your own housework. All you do is sleep on the bed all day, he said coldly. I'm not just sleeping, I'm working, I protested. You're working in bed, it's an easy job. You don't have to commute like I do, my husband scoffed. That's true, I admitted, but I'm trying my best to be useful to everyone. My family isn't happy with you because you can't take care of the house despite being my wife, he continued. It's no wonder they think you're useless. Do you really think so? I asked, feeling hurt. Well, don't get so sensitive, Cameron uttered dismissively. Just deal with it. You can't survive if you have to worry about every little thing, he added. My husband wasn't supportive at all. It's not that I don't feel inconvenienced by my body, but it's so frustrating to know that he doesn't care about me at all. I constantly wish I could walk or move like before. I wish that at least my husband could be sympathetic and understand how painful and sad I am. Am I selfish to feel that way? Even though I try not to cry, the tears flow. I was in an accident. I got this body, and yet I'm trying to look forward and do my best. I will not lose because of this. I have been pushing myself, thinking that there are many other people in the world who are suffering more than me. I feel sad that I don't have my parents to rely on at a time like this, but I also think that it's good because they don't need to see what I'm going through. But when I think that there's no one in this house to stand by me anymore, I feel more and more miserable. I don't have a home to go back to. I wondered if I could at least leave this house with my husband. While I was thinking about that, he threw even more shocking words at me. For a moment, I was happy that he was thinking about me. But the next words threw me into hell. I knew they were right, he muttered. What do you mean? I asked, dreading his answer. I think they'd be better off with a younger, healthy wife than you, he said bluntly. What? I whispered, stunned. I want to have an heir, after all. But with you, I'm not ready. I don't know, it's just impossible, he added. 
I felt as if someone had clubbed me in the head. I couldn't believe that my husband would say such a thing to me. I realized that I could no longer expect anything from him. Cameron said a lot of things after that, but I couldn't hear anything. The only thing I understood was that he wanted to divorce me. You're useless like a piece of trash, he said, his voice dripping with contempt. You may be paying for a housekeeper, but you don't make much money anyway, so you won't have anything left after paying the housekeeper's bill. You're just a burden to us. You're a parasite that hangs around our house, my husband concluded. His mother chimed in, right, even helpers don't come for free. Parasites that spend money for helpers should get out. I felt there was no point in staying here any longer after being told such things by both my husband and in-laws. I thought to myself, I don't have a home to go back to. I just have to find a new place to live. Okay, I'll move out, I decided. I asked Kate to help me find a new place to live. She was happy to help, and now all the procedures can be done online, which is very convenient. After all the paperwork was done, I gave Cameron the divorce papers. Good, you finally made up your mind, he said with a grin. But don't hate me. Hate yourself for having such a body, he added. Fine, I replied, added, are you sure you're okay with me leaving? Of course it's fine, he said. I'll find someone more suitable for me. Everybody says I'll find a better wife. Will you be able to make a living? I asked. Don't worry about that. Dad's retirement money is still there, and Freya says she got plenty of compensation for the affair. We won't have to worry about money for a while, so I don't need to depend on you anymore, Cameron concluded. Oh, sure. Then do what you like, I said, feeling numb. I thought Cameron seemed blind to reality. I moved out without saying anything and there were some positive things as well. Living alone, a helper could support me with my daily life. They could help with things like cleaning, laundry, and shopping. I felt really grateful. I continued to have Kate come by as before. In fact, she was a businesswoman who worked hard at a major company before she got married, and she's really digitally savvy. But being in a large corporation, it was an extremely competitive place, and she just got sick of it and quit when she got married. That was 20 years ago. Kate laughed when she said that, but I wondered if the reason she was able to stand up to my ex-in-laws came from her experience. So now, she is no longer my housekeeper, but is managing my business. She is happy to do it as a lifesaver. Besides, the new place I moved to is a barrier-free apartment that is wheelchair accessible, so I can move around by myself. The kitchen is spacious enough for me to cook. Just when I was beginning to think that I was finally getting used to my new life, my ex-mother-in-law started to call me a lot. But there was nothing more to talk about, so I decided to ignore the calls. Partly because Kate's support was great, and partly because I could focus on work without all the drama, my business was doing so much better, and I didn't have time to deal with my ex-mother-in-law. A year passed, I still hear from Freya, though not as often as before. My life was established so I decided it was time to settle things once and for all. And I picked up the phone. Hello? I answered. Finally, you answered, my ex-mother-in-law exclaimed. Why haven't you ever answered the phone? Uh, um, I was worried that something had happened, she chirped. Vanessa suddenly spoke to me in a sweet voice. She had never said anything like that when I lived there. I suspected that she was probably in trouble and remembered me. Hmm. I wonder what kind of life she had in the past year, I thought. I'm grateful for your concern, I said, trying to keep my voice steady. I'm fine and doing well. You don't need to worry about me. Oh, well, that's good to hear, Vanessa replied hesitantly. She paused for a moment before continuing. Um, by the way. Yes, I asked, curious about where this conversation was going. Well, do you still want to live with us like before? Vanessa's voice trembled slightly. Excuse me? I couldn't believe what I was hearing. You can't be happy living with a parasite, a piece of garbage, I added. I've been thinking about it a lot, Vanessa continued, her tone becoming more urgent. It wasn't right to leave you, a physically disabled person, alone. We'll take good care of you so you won't have to worry anymore, she concluded. I'm doing great, I replied firmly. Since I'm on my own, my helper can support me with my chores. They do my cleaning, laundry, and shopping. Besides, Kate helps me with my work. 
No issues at all, I replied. Vanessa shifted in her seat. Um, about that business, she said, her voice filled with curiosity. Is it true you're making more than Cameron? Yup, I answered with a small smile. But at the time of the divorce, he seemed to forget about it, I continued. He said that you're earning close to $15,000 every month, she uttered. My income was covering their living expenses. At the beginning, after the accident, they were helping me. At the same time, Cameron's company wasn't doing well and his pay was cut. But fortunately, my income had been increasing. So I offered to help. At first, he was saying things like, sorry. We didn't tell his parents anything since he said they would be worried if they found out his salary dropped. But after three years, he seemed to forget that I was paying for most things. I thought he should put aside his own salary when we divorced, but I didn't dare mention it. I also knew that the cause of Freya's divorce was not because of her husband cheating, but because of her. He also told me that Freya stole his money. Freya said that she received the money as alimony. He said that he would take back exactly what she took, and he would in turn charge her for compensation. I decided to get divorced before my in-laws learned the truth. When I confronted Vanessa about it, she was absolutely mortified. Cameron fell in love with a girl from a hostess bar and owed a bit of money, my mother-in-law said. Oh, so that's why he wanted a divorce. So he can leech off her earnings, I asked. He can't count on something like that, Vanessa said firmly. First of all, they weren't in a relationship. He was just another customer, she added. I know, I sighed. Did you know, my mother-in-law asked in surprise. Yep, all of it, I replied. Why didn't you tell me? Vanessa continued, frustration creeping into her voice. Did you also know that Cameron's company was in danger? She added. Yes, I answered calmly. How dare you not tell me when you knew? Vanessa's voice rose. According to Vanessa, Freya eloped with her unfaithful boyfriend, but he dumped her and came back crying with even more debts. Cameron's company went bankrupt six months ago, and he's now searching for a job, but he can't seem to find one that he thinks is suitable for him, and now he's just unemployed. He has lost all confidence in himself and has become a recluse. Because the kids are living with us, they completely used up dad's retirement fund, Vanessa admitted. There's only debts to pay. Really? I asked, incredulous. So if you come back, everything will be all right, my mother-in-law uttered. I don't get it, I responded. I really didn't understand what she meant by everything will be all right. I couldn't understand the nerve of someone who kicked me out like they did, and now they're saying something like this. I also wondered how it's possible to change so much in one year. It was sooner than I expected. Cameron probably had no clue that his company would actually go bankrupt. It was something that Cameron, who was so careless, would have done. Vanessa tearfully said that if she had known, she would not have let us get divorced, but it was much too late for that. In the end, all she is saying is that it's all about the money. The only important thing for her is herself. Freya says she doesn't feel like working right now since she's become a couch potato and is gaining weight. Oh, um, we sold the house to pay off the kids' debts, Vanessa said, almost as if she was confessing. The house was old and worthless, so they deducted the cost of clearing the land, and the location was bad, so they didn't get much money for it. Now the family of four adults is living in a cheap apartment with only one room and forced to live a hard life. Vanessa began to cry on the phone, saying, It's all your fault since you didn't answer my calls, only if I was able to reach you before we sold the house. What do you mean? I asked, shocked by her accusation. If you had known we were selling the house, you would have helped us, wouldn't you? Vanessa sobbed. You lived in that house too, so you must have some attachment to it, right? She added. Not at all, I replied, my voice cold. Huh? Vanessa seemed stunned. It amazed me how self-centered she was. I was really glad I didn't answer the phone earlier. Well, even if I had answered, there's no way I would have gone along with such a story. Oh, so both Cameron and Freya are being parasites to you, mother. No, Vanessa, I asked pointedly. So please, come back, Vanessa pleaded. You're the only one we can count on, she added. Nope, I said firmly. I'm not family. Don't rely on me. Don't say that. Vanessa begged. 
We're sorry for what we've done. I apologize, she apologized. I couldn't grasp how she could say this. I started to get a headache. I decided it was time to give them an ultimatum and call it a day. I declined. Ah, but the reason I picked up your call today is because I had something I want to let you know, I said. What is it? Vanessa asked, her voice wary. I'm going to sue all of you, I declared. W what Vanessa gasped. Why should we pay? Besides, it's not like he cheated on you. He wasn't even with the girl from the hostess bar, Vanessa tried to reason. It's not for cheating, I clarified. It's for the mental anguish caused by the verbal abuse I received from all of you, I added. Huh? Vanessa was taken aback. I told her that I recorded and videotaped all the abusive language from them. When I told her the evidence I had, she became quite upset and hung up the phone abruptly. Maybe she thought I might demand more if we continued our talk. I wonder if this was what it was like to feel guilty. When I made a request for compensation through my lawyer, Vanessa tearfully pleaded to somehow make it go away. They complained about the current situation. Of course, there was no way I would accept. I had been asked to illustrate a picture book. I'm one step closer to my dream of becoming a picture book author someday. Many things have happened to me, but I will continue to live my life positively and without taking myself too seriously, 